The story you're about to hear was told to me in the strictest of confidence. Certain names, dates and locations have been changed to protect that confidence. Events that feature in this story may be part of the public record. If you believe you recognise any of the people, places or events that appear in this story, ask you not to reveal any information publicly, out of respect for the subject's right to remain anonymous. David Paul Nixon, and you're listening to the New Ghost Stories podcast, where we delve into the New Ghost Stories archive to hear witness accounts of the supernatural. Stories that could be delusions, lies, fantasies, or perhaps even the real thing. Just don't make your mind up until you've listened. I find it very easy to understand why people are afraid of ghosts. Even if your idea of a ghost is the classic one, a shadowy figure clothed in period costume, wandering the corridors of a country house, to see one, alive but dead, living in the shadows, a half-existence doomed to walk the same steps over and over, forever. Putting the existential questions of life and death aside, it's terrifying on a gut level. Whatever we may think about an afterlife, we know that dead is dead. It's finite, there should be no coming back. To see something alive but dead at the same time, it's wrong, it's unnatural, it's uncanny. The apparition doesn't have to be terrifying for us to be afraid on a deep, instinctual level. That I get. It makes sense to me. What I've never really been able to understand is the fear of spiders. I mean, I get that they're not the most appealing of creatures. Bugs and insects aren't really terribly photogenic. They move in strange ways, hide in strange places, and their presence is rarely welcome. But they're also small, tiny even. If you see a spider, they're not difficult to deal with, especially if you have a slipper or a rolled up newspaper to hand, and you're quick. It's not as if spiders are even amongst the grossest of insects. Earthworms, cockroaches, wood lice, are much more disgusting, at least in my view, although you don't suddenly find them trapped in the sink or in the shower when you least expect them. Spiders just don't pose any kind of risk to us. Those that are venomous make up a very small number of the species that exist, and amongst those there are just a couple of species that could actually be considered deadly. And that story you might have heard about swallowing a certain number of spiders in your sleep every year is just not true, it's completely made up. Yet arachnophobia ranks as one of the world's most common phobias. It's estimated that 3-15% to of the whole world's population could be considered fully arachnophobic. And there are plenty more people who may not be brought out in sheer naked terror when they see a spider crawling across the floor but they will still feel the need to force their boyfriend out of bed in the evening to perform a late-night extraction when they've just settled down to read for the night. I shan't be mentioning any names here, of course. This fear does seem to be something deeply ingrained in us. It may be a kind of evolutionary hangover. Perhaps at one time poisonous spiders were more common and a real threat to us, though that time has long since passed. It's kind of ironic that the protagonist of today's case is not one of the arachnophobes. He is a passionate advocate of spiders, or at least he was, once. Even enthusiasts have their limits. I've heard a lot of strange stuff since I started collecting these new ghost stories. When I open a new email or visit someone face to face to hear what they have to say, I never really know what I'm going to get. So far we've had tales of vengeful spirits, mischievous children, events replaying over and over, occult ceremonies and even enormous crowds of the undead. But some stories, they belong in a category I have informally labelled weird shit. I guess our last short episode, Glass Eye, would also fit into this category. Stories that may not be strictly speaking ghost stories, but they're certainly supernatural. 
and they still hit all the same fear centres of the brain. If you're one of the arachnophobes, or just someone who finds spiders a bit icky, then this episode could be a tough one for you. And if you're someone like me, who doesn't quite get what's just so terrifying about spiders, then you might find something here to change your mind. This is New Ghost Stories case number 223, and it's called Master of Spiders. And you can hear it in full after these messages. Before we start, I want to ask a quick favour. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the show a review. It really helps people to find the show and for me to share it with new listeners. You can review the show on Apple Podcasts or on the Spotify mobile app if you go to the show page and tap the three dot button. It really does make a huge difference. Thank you. And now, on with the story. My sister, she she hates spiders, so it was absolutely essential for me to love them. And they really are fascinating creatures. A spider silk web, that's the strongest material in the world. Even with all today's technology, we've never been able to find a way to replicate it, to manufacture a material that can recreate its tensile strength. We're not even close. But I needed these weapons against my sister. She's four years older than me, and when you're a child, that's a big difference, a big difference. I don't think she ever really got over me being born. Obviously, she was the only child, and then I came along, and then I turned out to be gifted. And that's always been a big deal, because since then, the focus has always been more on me than on her. That's not my fault. That's just the way it is. It isn't as if my parents disowned her. But they saw that I was very intelligent, highly intelligent, much more so than the average. And that naturally took their focus. Quite frankly, what did she expect? She certainly didn't have to take it out on me. What did I know? I was just a kid, even if I was a gifted one. So naturally, I would seek weapons to redress the balance should she try to bully me and push me around, which, by the way, my parents were always too light on her for. She would get away with things I could never get away with. If her test results were down at school, they weren't getting on her back, not the way that they were on mine. At first, it was just little spiders. I might just capture them outside and put them in her room, or drop them in a glass of water she was drinking when she didn't notice. And that got me a few jumps, and a few scares, and a few punches in the arm, all of which were worth it, totally worth it. At first my parents didn't think I was behind it, as if I could be the master of spiders. But eventually, they started to get wise to it, probably because I was enjoying it so much. I had to come up with another approach, and that's when I unveiled my master plan. I was collecting this part work magazine, Bugs, fascinating facts for kids about insects. I was always reading stuff like this, well above my age group. And with this magazine, every week you would get a piece of a model tarantula. Not one of my favourite arachnid families, but they're what most kids would have heard about. They've got the reputation, quite undeserved, of being scary, deadly spiders. It was a big model. The legs stretched out about the size of an A3 sheet of paper. But the best thing about this model spider, by far the best thing, was that it glowed in the dark. It was going to scare the absolute pants off my sister. And I was definitely not disappointed. I snuck into her room while she was in the bath and placed it under her duvet. I then, and this was the really clever part, to make sure she really got the full effect, I replaced her light bulb with a broken one. She wouldn't be able to turn the light on. She'd just use her desk lamp, keeping it pretty dark, and then just change the bulb in the morning. That I predicted correctly. It sucked totally that I couldn't see her uncover the spider. I weighed the consequences of hiding away in her room somewhere, but I couldn't find a spot where I would be seen and where I'd still get full view. I could still obviously hear the scream. (laughs) I can still hear it now in my head. She was hysterical. It was incredible, just incredible. I'll admit, my plan was a little short-sighted. I knew my parents would come down on me like a ton of bricks. I was prepared for that. What I hadn't quite planned for was the immediate wrath of my sister. As I said, she is bigger than me, (laughs) and that's actually still the case. Wendy has always been unusually well built. 
only just managed to get to the door in my room to barricade myself in. My parents had to restrain her. It was complete chaos. But I couldn't have been more pleased with the result, even if it did mean being grounded for a month. It was shock and awe. And that's how I dealt with my older sister. Shock and awe. But my fascination with spiders was not just about sibling warfare. I absolutely, sincerely love these creatures. I sort of still do. They are just astounding. Arachnophobia is just the most ridiculous of fears. Hardly any spiders are in any way harmful to humans. And those that are, you know, actually, they're not the big hairy ones they'd have you believe were deadly on TV. People have that misconception. The most dangerous to humans are actually very small, like the general size of most house spiders. My fascination was entirely genuine, and I wanted to know more. And obviously, I wanted to go and visit London Zoo, because, let's face it, London Zoo is cool. I knew that. I'd seen it on television, on The Really Wild Show, and I wanted to go. (laughs) Why wouldn't I? Not the easiest sell to my parents. Trips to London are expensive. There's the four of us to pay for. Transport, food, yada yada yada. Oh, and now suddenly Wendy's against zoos. They're boring or wrong or whatever. Essentially, she's getting back at me. So transparent and so typically petty of her. Mum and Dad tried to get me over it with other zoos, but just like a kid who's being made to eat Tesco cornflakes instead of Kellogg's cornflakes, no, they're not the same, and I knew that, and I wasn't going to accept any cheap old second best. Took a lot of nagging, but I wore them down. When Wendy went on a brownies camping weekend away at the beginning of the Easter holiday, I argued, successfully, that if they were going to pay for her to go on such an outing, I deserved something, as they were effectively spending money on her that they were not spending on me. And that wasn't fair. Not fair at all. Besides, they knew they would so obviously enjoy a trip to London Zoo. Who wouldn't? And without Wendy, it would also cost less, and we wouldn't have to put up with her all sulking and moaning all day. In actuality, however, it was not her that I should have worried about. It was Mum and Dad, because, well... They've never really been the best match parents in the world. My father, he's a kind of extrovert, and impulsive, and funny, and always kind of, you know, ready for action, a real fun type of guy. And my mother, she's more of your button-down, planning, well-organised, thoughtful kind of person. In some ways, they complemented each other, but more often they just clashed and drove each other nuts. And to go on a day out down to London... Nothing could have spread the wildfires of discontent between them. Mum went into major planning mode, as she does, while my dad, let's be honest, I think he'd admit that he sometimes deliberately provoked her by being difficult, being slower than he should be, or not picking up things he should have. He dragged his heels. We were late leaving the house. We almost missed the train. Things got off to a tense start. When we arrived, I obviously wanted to go straight to the bugs and insect exhibits, but my parents were like, what's the rush? Though as soon as mum started planning out our route, dad had to go off schedule and do his own thing almost immediately. But London Zoo is great. There's the whole penguin thing, which is fun. And the meerkats and the, you know, sometimes it's the animals you don't expect to be interesting that you find to be interesting. Anteaters, for example. They're huge. I was expecting these little dog-sized things like in the cartoons, but they were these huge shaggy animals over a metre long, and I just wasn't expecting that. Also what I wasn't expecting was how dull the lions were. Lazy, lazy animals, just lying around getting the lionesses to do the work for them, and just waiting to be fed. Finally we got to go where I was dying to go, the bug house. At first, I was kind of disappointed, because it obviously wasn't all spiders. I don't know why I thought it would be, but I was a kid. I had strange ideas. But the spiders they did have. I was acting like a guide to my parents, taking them through tank to tank, talking them through the species, most of which I recognised. I had amazing recall, even then. They had such exotic spiders. I knew they had the golden orb spiders, Nephla clavapis but I wasn't expecting Danobis subrifer, the ogre-faced spider, 
which has these amazing big marble-like eyes. And there was Bagheera Kiplingi, a jumper spider that's, guess what, the only vegetarian spider in the whole world. Well, at least known to science at this point, there's still, you know, a remarkable amount of species we probably haven't even discovered. You'd think after all these centuries of exploration, we'd have seen it all. But new species are found all the time. It is just incredible. I might as well have been conducting my own tour of the spider section, because I was talking my parents through the spiders, telling them about Paraplectana, a spider that mimics a ladybird's spots, not to ensnare prey, but to put off prey, because ladybirds are so disgusting to eat. Imagine the evolutionary path that led to that. It is just extraordinary. So I was telling my parents about this, and I was being so fascinating myself, sharing all this knowledge that other people started to notice, and they started to gather around and listen to me. And before you know it, one of the curators was there listening and saying how much I knew and how impressed he was with all the knowledge I had. His name was Christian Backman, a name I'll never forget. He was so impressed with how much I knew about the spiders that he decided to show me something special, just me. He allowed me to hold and touch one of the spiders. But not just any spider. He took me to the far end of the spider house to one large tank. And there, in all its glory, was Therophosa blondi, the Goliath bird eater spider. And if its name makes it sound big, there's a good reason. It is the largest spider in the world. They can grow up to 28 centimetres long. I mean, think about that. That's almost as long as a classroom ruler. He let me hold it, well, part of it. It was too big to just hold in both my hands. And this one was still a bit shorter, more like 22, 24 centimetres long. People all around me were scared and frightened, but I wasn't. This was a beautiful, amazing creature. I was only scared that I might hurt it or drop it. I could have watched that spider move for hours. Such grace, such precision, such a perfect specimen. I begged Christian Backman to show me more. He was very kind. I was just some kid going on and on about spiders. And he was a guy who had his job to do. But he still let me help him feed the bird eater. That freaked my parents out the dried flies he had to feed them. I could not have been more excited just watching him move, this beautiful creature. I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd get to be that close. My parents did literally have to drag me out of there and told me to leave the man alone. I wanted his job. I wanted to do it all myself. I totally spoilt the afternoon. I threw such a tantrum about being dragged away from the bug house, that I saw Christian Backman look at me like I was a nightmare, and he walked away from me. When I saw this and realised that he was revolted by my behaviour, I thought I'd lost my new best friend, and I blamed that on my parents too. We went around a few more exhibits, but I was basically refusing to look at anything. I had my arms folded and kept my head looking straight at the ground. Mum, Ever the disciplinarian, wasn't taking this behaviour lightly. When it became clear I was not going to give up my tantrum, she threatened to take me home. My dad was less embarrassed by my behaviour. He said she was taking it too seriously. If he, by that I, I mean me, was going to sulk, let him sulk. We can still enjoy the place. Besides which, the park was only going to be open for another hour or so longer, so it didn't make any sense for us to leave. Representing his opposite view of parenting, my father suggested a bribe. He would get me ice cream if I behaved for the rest of the day. I consented, basically, and we saw the aquatic mammals and the ancient sea turtles and a variety of creatures and ended up at this cafe where my father went to get ice cream. And I was still in a sulk, but, you know, basically improving and at least looking up and around at things. Mum, however, is still kind of tense. 
and then the worst thing possible happens. She sees my dad chatting to the woman behind the counter and sharing a joke together. And when my mum sees that, I should give some context here. At the time, even I didn't know about this, but my father had had an affair, or at least had slept with someone else. Mum now thinks that he had all kinds of affairs, but she never has really forgiven him for leaving her. They were mismatched, but my mum didn't want to let go. Anything but be on her own. So him chatting to this woman, this pretty younger woman, triggers an argument and they start to go at each other. Can't I just talk to a woman? This is how it starts, isn't it? You're paranoid. You can't help yourself. Obviously, I'm hating this. I can't take this. I don't know how to handle this because I'm young. Even a smart kid like me can't hack it. And I was angry at them both for the way they were behaving. And I was the one supposed to be behaving like a child. Were they any better? I don't think so. So I ran off. I didn't want to be listening to them. And I think some part of me was thinking, this'll show you. I'm going to disappear. This will upset you and you'll deserve it. And they were so wrapped up in their stupid row, they didn't even notice. I didn't really think I'd get very far. It took a few moments to realise that they hadn't seen me and that they weren't coming after me. And with me actually free to do what I wanted, I decided to go back to the bug house. Why not? Imagine my horror though, and when I got there and found it was locked up already. I was pretty devastated. Until I saw a staff door not closed properly. It was just hanging open a little. Well, I just couldn't help myself. I pulled it open and peered inside. There was no one there. One door led back into the bug house. But now I was here. I wanted to explore the private and forbidden. Get a look behind the scenes. It was so quiet. Heading in the opposite direction, I walked into a changing room with lockers and a shower, which then led into a storeroom with metal shelves stacked with tools, replacement tanks and other assorted things. There was also a huge metal container, which I guessed rightly was a chiller, where they kept the insect and animal food. It was all very dark. Most of the lights were off and there were no windows and the place was deserted. There was no one about. I ended up in a dark corridor, just a few doors. The first led to an office and the next one to a break room. There was no light except from the last door at the end of the corridor. There was a dim glow coming from there and this strange sound, a scraping sound mixed with a tapping sound. I was kind of scared, but still curious. I went to the door slowly. It was open far enough for me to look inside without making a sound. It was the security room. The light was coming from a stack of television screens, showing scenes from around the park, from the pavements outside to the enclosures and viewing areas, and even the door outside the bug house where I had entered but without anyone noticing me. And how? Because the man in the security room was not watching the cameras. He was stretched over a chair. His head was dangling over the back. His arms were hanging from his sides. He was shaking. He was trembling. The chair legs were scraping across the floor and his shoe heels knocking against the tiles. He was covered head to toe in spiders. Hundreds, thousands, all kinds of species, the small, the large, the rare, the exotic. They walked and crawled all over him, moved in and out of his clothes, up his sleeves and trouser legs, in between the buttons on his shirt. They walked over his face. A huge hairy tarantula was resting over one of his eyes. Webs were being made on his chest, between his fingers, over his shoelaces. He was breathing fast, short, sharp. Breaths, like a man having a fit. As an adult, I look back on his face, his breathing, his trembling. It was orgasmic. This man was in a state of ecstasy. Sick ecstasy. Twisted pleasure. He turned to look at me. Christian Backman. Spiders fell from his face. 
From between his lips, Get out! He screamed, Get out! I ran, of course I ran. I got the heck out of that building. I was running about outside in a panic and somehow found my way into my mother's arms. She was searching for me in a foul mood and was puzzled by the automatic hug I gave her. She yelled that we were leaving, with or without my father, although he did manage to catch up. I could hardly speak. I was so terrified. I wanted to tell my parents, but I didn't think they would believe me. Why would they believe me? They might have noticed I was behaving strangely, but they were too busy being angry with each other and working really hard not to speak to each other. So I was just sat there, paralysed with fear. I could not speak. I felt like being sick. What the fuck was that? To this day, I could not tell you. To this day. And I am an intelligent man, a scientist, and I cannot begin to describe or understand what the fuck was going on in that room right then with that man. When we got home, my parents got the privacy they needed to have their full blazing row, and I just went to my room, crawled beneath my sheets and stayed there. No dinner, no food. I just went to sleep eventually. They'd pretend to make it up in due course, but not before ruining the rest of the holidays. When Wendy got home, they still weren't talking. When she found out it had all started at the zoo, that was her excuse to start blaming things on me. She was always blaming me for things that I had nothing to do with. I had nightmares for days after. When I saw a spider, even I was scared. Suddenly I was worried they were after me, that Christian Backman was really the master of spiders, that he could control them, and through them he could spy on me. I would check my room every night for spiders for the rest of the holiday. Every night I would move around the furniture, check under the bed, in the back of my wardrobe. I would check everywhere. For over a week I looked but then things started to calm down and my parents had a truce. Soon I was going back to school and things started to return to normal. I still didn't share what had happened with anyone. I just didn't want to think about it. I wanted to think it was from some other reality, that temporarily I'd just stepped into another world and that it was some strange isolated incident, unexplained and unrepeatable. Life just went on for just a little while. I was going to bed on a Friday evening. I'd cleaned my teeth. I'd changed into my pyjamas. I was looking forward to going to sleep quickly so I could wake up soon to watch Saturday morning cartoons. Things were well and truly back to normal. Only, just as I was about to turn out the light, I spotted on my desk a spider moving. Just a small, common house spider, Tegenaria duelica, crawling behind a pot of pens. I'm scared. I creep over and tip out the pens and drop the pot on top of the spider, trapping it. I'm relieved. Until I hear a voice. I see you. My floor is covered in spiders. They weren't there a second before. Now there's millions crawling across my floor, crawling on my naked feet. I jump on the bed, but they're already climbing up there. They're climbing the walls. They're climbing the curtains, falling from the ceiling. Help me, he whispers. I look up. He's there, Christian Backman, in a giant spider's web. He's wrapped up like a mummy in spider's silk. The spiders are spread all over. He looks at me dead-eyed and screams, Help me! He spits spiders from his mouth and they hit me in the face. They're on the bed, raining from above. I get beneath my sheets and start screaming, screaming, screaming. My sheets are ripped off. I scream so hard I wet myself. But it's Dad. What's wrong? What's going on? 
I'm basically having a fit. I don't believe him when he says there are no spiders and that I've been having a nightmare. I wasn't asleep. I swear to you, look at me. Look at me in the eye. I was not asleep. I was not having a nightmare. Maybe I was in some kind of nightmare. Some kind of projection. But I was not asleep. For that moment, everything I saw was real. Don't ask me to explain it. There is no explanation. And believe me, as a scientist, I find the lack of a real, rational explanation a real fucking problem. A harder pill to swallow than anything else. The next day, my parents came over to me. They're all serious and they take me into the kitchen and they tell me that the nice man who we met at the zoo, Christian Backman, has died. And they wanted to tell me in case I saw it on the news, which, you know, I probably would do. They tried to explain it to me. I just took the newspaper off them and read about it myself. It was reported as a strange and mysterious death. He was found dead at his home, where he was found to have a private zoo of arachnids, which he could not have legally owned. He must have bred and stolen them from the zoo, or even smuggled them in. In any case, he was supposed to have died because he was experimenting with spiders' venoms and poisons, and had injected himself with them. You know, before meeting with you, I went back and I did my research and I looked up these old stories. Some of the papers, they had ridiculous theories about him trying to synthesise narcotics out of spider venom. That it was some kind of drug binge. Just makes no sense. The amount of venom you could extract from a spider is tiny. The number of spiders he'd have to have. And if he injected himself with venom, he must have known what was going to happen. He was an entomologist even if he was just working at London Zoo. He was qualified. Doesn't make any sense. He could have been bitten by accident, but none of the papers say that. I mean, I expect the tabloids to be making stuff up, but it's in the serious papers too. He was injected with venom, with a syringe. Maybe he was trying to build up an immunity. But then there's the other things. What I saw that day, I just don't... I don't get it. I stand before you a scientist, and I have seen things and experienced things that I cannot in any way explain. That scares me. That really scares me. I don't think I've got anything else to say. When I look at a spider now, I think, what do you know? What do you know that I don't? Thank you for listening to the New Ghost Stories podcast. If you've enjoyed the podcast and would like to support what I do, please consider leaving a review on any platform and subscribing to hear future releases. You can also become a patron and enjoy some bonus content by signing up at patreon.com slash new ghost stories. This story features in the book 14 New Ghost Stories, which is available from Amazon, Apple Books and other book retailers. This podcast is written, presented and produced by David Paul Nixon. If you'd like to find out more about New Ghost Stories, visit my website newghoststories.substack.com and to get all the latest from me, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at New Ghost Stories. Next time on the New Ghost Stories podcast, he's about to leave for his Christmas holidays until he suddenly tests positive.